We're here to shut down the white supremacist Charles Murray. Is that right? Many people hate this man. They call Charles Murray dangerous. Why? Because he wrote this book, which includes research into IQ differences among different racial groups. Charles Murray, get out of town! By any means necessary, shut him down! But the activist's reflexive anger obscures the fact that Murray's not a white supremacist. He's a thoughtful researcher. He's published more than a dozen scholarly books. This one, The Pursuit of Happiness and Good Government, influenced the way I think about government. It's about how, as a young Peace Corps volunteer in Thailand, he saw how government aid made people dependent and even unhappy. They destroyed the ability of that village to run its own affairs. They weren't as united. They weren't, didn't function as a community. I saw what government looks like from Bangkok and how it looks to the villager, and it's the same as in the United States. Where billions more is being spent on government welfare programs, and more Americans become dependent on government. Aren't you upset? I'm deeply depressed. No, it's worse than that. I don't see a way back out. So and why are you smiling? <laughs> because what else am I going to do? Americans becoming dependent on government is the theme of Murray's best-selling book, Losing Ground. Losing Ground influenced presidents. The scholarly work of Charles Murray. Presidents from both parties. I think he did the country a great service. Bill Clinton then passed welfare reform. No one wants to change the welfare system as badly as those who are trapped in it. But today's activists ignore all Murray's work except for the bell curve. Oh, Murray, go away! Racist activists act like that! These students at Vermont's expensive Middlebury College stopped Murray from speaking. They consider his ideas too dangerous to even let people hear them. I think it's important to hear what people like him say. We talked for more than an hour. Middlebury, what, what did you think? I was shocked. And I'm smiling because I was shocked, but not uh, scared, not, oh dear, what's going to happen? I'm standing up in front of the crowd, and they're all chanting and chanting and chanting, but I don't really think that anybody's going to rush the stage. And they didn't. And so that was a situation I'd been in before. I'd had protests and people chanting at speeches. What I did not have any other time after we left the stage and went down to stream my speech in a little studio where people banging on the walls and trying to get into the room, trying to get through the door. And all at once I said, this is, this is no fun. And then it ended, the day ended with uh, us walking out to go to the car. By we, I mean Bill Berger, who was one of the administrators who was uh, running the event, and, and Allison Stanger, the professor who was uh, moderating my appearance. And we come out the door, and we have two security guys, Middlebury security guys, but just two. And there's a mob out there with some really big guys that didn't look like Middlebury students to me who are standing between us and where we have to go. And uh, you suddenly realized you didn't have the option of just standing there or going back in the building, which would have been craven. So we just pushed ahead. And at that point, yeah, at that point, I, I remember saying to myself, do not fall down. Do not go to the ground because that felt like a really bad idea. What might have happened? They're not going to trample you. I had the feeling that that group just might. But remember, Allison Stanger's holding on to my elbow, not to protect herself. She's protecting me. She's leading. And she gets a concussion and strained tendons when somebody bangs into her from one direction and somebody had grabbed onto her hair from another direction. So uh, for her, it was no fun at all. And in fact, she couldn't teach for the rest of the term because of the concussion. They're that angry at you because you're perpetuating racism. These kids had never read a word of anything I'd ever written. So it's, it was a ginned up phenomenon that also hit a lot of other people on the right who tried to talk at colleges. My wife's theory, and I think she's right, is this is, they want a way to get at Trump and anybody on the right is sort of their way of expressing their anger at what's going on. So I'm not at all sure it was specifically focused on the work of Charles Murray. 
I think it's Charles Murray as, as portrayed by the Southern Poverty Law Center that they were going after. The Southern Poverty Law Center calls you a white nationalist. Yeah, they call almost anybody a white nationalist who they don't like. That outfit is so sleazy. They say, you say, white men are intellectually, psychologically, and morally superior. I've never said that. I've never said anything remotely like that. And once I had uh, what I called editing my Southern Poverty Law Center material, and I went through and I copy edited it all and with, with comments about, you really got to take out this because I never said it. Or in other cases, they have a quote and I say, well, yeah, that quote I said, but here are the next three sentences you left out. Uh, of course, nobody ever really reads that kind of thing. I put it on the AEI website. But the fact is that you have people at the Southern Poverty Law Center who are willing to lie and pull out of context and they would be laughable except they get so much attention. And you think the kids read what the Southern Poverty Law Center writes? You know, I'd like to have a better grip on who it is that communicates all this stuff. But obviously about a variety of people, and I'm one of them, the caption for me is he believes uh, blacks are genetically inferior to whites. The students, they don't feel any obligation to investigate this. They just take it as... Do you believe that uh, blacks are intellectually inferior? I bridle at the word inferior. What, what do I believe? In the same sense that I believe that the Battle of Gettysburg occurred, it is that if you give mental tests to a representative sample of whites and a representative sample of blacks that there will be about a one standard deviation difference, which amounts to about 15 IQ points between those scores. To then translate that into people being inferior and superior is idiotic. Are you really under the impression that someone who has an IQ that's 20 point lower than yours feels inferior to you? I know lots of people out near my home in rural Maryland, who I'm sure of two things. One, they can do all sorts of things that are really important to my life that I can't do, such as fix the plumbing, get my electrical circuits working correctly. I'd be stuck if they weren't around. And the, the second thing is, I am quite confident that they don't look at me and, and think that they are inferior to me in any way. I am somewhat different than them in my skill set and in my lifestyle and things like that. So what? You don't think they look at you and say, oh, he's incompetent. These intellectuals can't do anything. Oh, of course they say that. But of course they're being, they're being accurate when they say that. That when they look at me and they roll their eyes when I'm so happy that they've come out and fixed something that if I were a competent male, I could have fixed uh, myself. But they don't think of that as being anything more than a quirk. Suppose that they would have trouble doing advanced calculus. <laughs> so what, you know, in terms of evaluating them as a human being? This all starts with your book, The Bell Curve. These are the bell curves, the distribution of IQ. And whites are, as you say, a standard deviation ahead. But I'm told the tests are biased. Well, that falls in the category of this huge gap between what is known scientifically and what the elite conventional wisdom is. Because you're right, the elite conventional wisdom is the tests are biased. That has been studied to a fairly well. And I'm not talking about six studies say that they are biased and 10 studies say that they aren't. I say I can point to a hundred studies that are, were unable to find any evidence of bias virtually, versus virtually none that have any empirical reason for saying they're biased. You stand by it today. Blacks on average have a lower IQ. Blacks on average have a lower IQ than whites. East Asians on average have a higher IQ than whites. Ashkenazi Jews have higher, higher IQs than Gentile uh, whites. If you take a hierarchy of, of groups and their mean IQs, whites are not at the top. We are probably number three 
or number four? The New York Times Magazine's response to this is to call you the most dangerous conservative. You said you were surprised how fierce the attacks were. Why were you surprised? Well, this just goes to show how out of touch I was when we were writing it. By the way, people who haven't read the bell curve should understand we're talking about chapter 13. So what went on in the 12 preceding chapters? The 12 preceding chapters were talking about the role of IQ in all sorts of outcomes in life, from income to education to child rearing and so forth. And we said at the beginning of all those chapters so that we can sort of take the whole race issue out of the, uh, out of the t- uh, conversation, let's just look at a sample of non-Latino whites. And here's, here's why IQ is important. Okay, so we get to chapter 13. I thought Dick Hernstein, my co-author, and I did a beautiful job on that chapter. I thought we said to the reader, people run screaming from the room if you talk about black and white differences in IQ, and actually there's no reason to do that. You can look at all the facts squarely in the face, and this is not something that should cause you to lose sleep at night. It's, it's not a big deal. Why is it not a big deal? Because you judge other people as individuals, not as members of groups in supposedly this society. That is the ideal. And if we sit down across from each other and you are black, I can't assume that you're not as smart as I am. And if you sit down across from me and you're Asian, I can't assume that I'm not as smart as you are. I've got to talk to you and deal with you as an individual. And if you do that, group means in something like IQ are just as meaningless as group means in something like fast twitch muscles which accounts for the fact that uh, I don't think there's been a white winner of the 100-yard dash in the Olympics for a zillion years. Not quite literally that, but close. You don't judge people by what color they are in the starting block of the race. You judge them by how it ends up. Uh, And if you treat people as individuals, most of the problems go away. But it's generally forbidden to even talk about, let alone study, racial differences. And the sprinters are a good example. You were quoted saying, you thought people would say, it's about time we're talking about these issues that have been swept under the rug. Yep. And I interviewed you for 2020 and thought, yeah, we ought to discuss these issues because people whisper about them and that's not good. And they think it's a lot worse than it is. However, I had to revisit this uh, just a couple of years ago after the Black Lives Matter thing. And the, the most recent book I wrote was called Facing Reality. And it was two truths about race in America and having to do with crime rates and having to do with IQ. And the reason I felt compelled to do that was... It is not the case that thousands of black men are being shot by cops at random. In fact, the numbers are, you know, you're talking very small numbers. And if they say, oh, but more blacks are shot than whites, people have got to come to grips with the fact that the people who are committing the crimes, there's a racial differential. So this is a case where group outcomes did become important not because people like me were saying something, but because Microsoft executives and the Black Lives Matter people and the evening news. Here's another problem impacting black people and other people of color, systemic racism. And everybody else was saying things about racism in this society on the basis of evidence that simply ignored these group differences in IQ and in, and in crime rates. And so I figured I did not have the option of sitting back and not writing anything. Facing reality does not have a dedication. It does not have any acknowledgments. I wanted to keep my friends and colleagues as segregated from any identification with this as I could, because I thought that book would raise a, a ruckus. 
We didn't. For more of my content, go to johnstossel.com. I post a new short video every Tuesday. That's at johnstossel.com. When I talked to you for 2020, much like we are now, I thought in the 15 minutes at the time we had for stories on 2020, we might have a serious discussion. But then I was disappointed they decided, no, we can't even then. Long before Black Lives Matter, we, we don't want to put this on. And I reluctantly called you and told you, expecting you to be very upset, because uh, we have a, had a big audience then. Uh, but you just said, you know, it's just as well. This doesn't make anyone happy. And it wasn't the point of the book. The point of the book, of, of the bell curve, was that IQ has become really important in explaining a variety of phenomena in this country. Uh, a theme I return to and coming apart 20 odd years later because a lot of the polarization and the segregation and the elite attitudes toward things have been driven by the way that over the course of the 20th century, the whole social structure of the United States has been affected by the increasing importance of IQ in the economy. That's the point. And it's more important now because... It's worth a lot more money to be really smart now than it used to be. If you go back to the 1920s and you're a lawyer, you're probably making a good income. In the town you live in, you're in the upper middle class. But you aren't rich because you can charge lawyers fees for doing wills and, and, uh, and, and minor legal things. If you have exactly the same level of ability as a lawyer now, if you are doing multinational deals, you can be worth a commission of millions of dollars putting together these extremely complex things. That happened not just in the law, it happened in advertising, it happened in the IT industry, obviously. And people have gotten rich because they have high IQ in a way now that didn't happen in 1900. Another aspect of it, is that, guess what, you had an increasing, an elite that was increasingly convinced of its own superiority. Because I will tell you one people, set of people who really do think that having a high IQ is a big deal in terms of your human worth are people with really high IQs, especially in academia. And when they get up in the morning, they're comparing themselves to their colleagues. Am I as smart as that guy? And they really do look down on people who aren't as smart as they are. And that attitude of looking down at the yokels is palpable now in a way that in 1950 would not have happened because it was the moral center and the spine of the country was seen in ordinary people and we called these intellectuals long hairs, and they were kind of objects of ridicule and fun. And that flipped. So that's just a couple of examples of why this is so important to what's gone on. I only read The Bell Curve, and it wasn't easy, uh, because I was influenced by your previous work in pursuit of happiness and good government. This was jaw-dropping for me. I'd been a consumer reporter. I was starting to look at the government's solutions I was advocating. I discovered your book and thought, oh my God, this, this is it. This explains so much I haven't understood before. And one example, you write about your time with the Peace Corps in Thailand. Tell us about that. Well, you are referring to my own favorite of my books, In Pursuit. Good. And... Uh, Basically, John, I've been in the tank for you ever since you first told me that you liked that <laughs> book, uh, because I, I, I like it too, and it's not well known at all. And this is why I quit my job back in 1979, a good job. I was chief scientist of a good-sized research company, because I wanted to explore the relationship of human happiness, human flourishing, if you want to call it that, to policy. And that's the book I wanted to write. The basic idea of In Pursuit is as follows. Human flourishing, human happiness defined pretty much as Aristotle defined it, namely 
lasting and justified satisfaction with life as a whole. And a quick example of why this is relevant to policy, think in terms of the basic human need for respect and self-respect. I think that is a built-in, hardwired human need. I think we all want to achieve self-respect. If you are a guy who uh, is not the smartest guy in the world, but you work hard at a manual job, and you make money that supports a wife and children, puts food on the table and a roof over their head, historically in the United States of America, you had standing within your community that was equal to everybody else. You were being, you were being a good American, taking care of yourself, taking care of your family, even though you weren't making a lot of money. Suppose we have a social policy which has the following results. It gives that guy more money, but he also doesn't work for it. He just gets it. Uh, in what does this do to his self-respect? What does this do to his place in the community? Well, if he continues to support a wife and child at his manual job, it doesn't shouldn't do anything to it. But in fact, it does, because he's less likely to do that. You know, why am I doing this boring job if I don't have to? So you have something that is seen usually as a good thing. We increase the money going to low-income people, and I'm saying that's not good enough. You've got to analyze how social policy is affecting the ability of people to live satisfying, meaningful lives, and in pursuit was the result. And you cite that Aristotle said the route to happiness was pushing hard to achieve goals and yeah, he, struggling. Yeah, he wanted to, he said you ought to live a life of activity in accord with virtue. And by that I mean it's not enough to, to feel good. You can feel good with drugs. You have to have a justified reason for feeling good, and you don't have that with drugs. And also Aristotle said something that I think is so profound about human enjoyment. Human beings enjoy the exercise of their realized capacities. Why is it that J.K. Rowling still writes books? She has zero financial incentive to write books. She is realizing, exercising her realized abilities. On a much lesser scale, why, why do I continue to write books? <laughs> why do I continue to make videos? Or why That's what a, I'm good at. No, I don't consider I'm exercising my realized capabilities now, John. You are. I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm exercising my realized abilities when I'm sitting in front of that computer monitor, staring at it, typing for a minute, erasing it, going back and doing it again. And I enjoy that. That's true up and down the line. A, wood, a, a cabinet maker gets the same kind of satisfaction. And that's at the core. You want a society in which people are given lots and lots of opportunities and incentives to learn how to do something well that they love doing. And in pursuit of happiness and good government, you write about a model village, the pride of the government in Thailand. Cascaded projects, a fish pond, a new school building, cotton growing project, and a health clinic. Yeah, and he was, he was well-meaning. I knew him. I talked to him. But he sort of looked upon the villagers as these objects so that he was trying to help. And the village before he... Much like our government does for us now. Well, that's why the process of being in Thailand had such a profound effect on me. I saw what government looks like from Bangkok and how it looks to the villager. And it's the same as in the United States, the way government looks from Washington, D.C. versus the way it looks out in a little town in Maryland where I live. What they did when they came in there was they destroyed the ability of that village to run its own affairs. And that made a huge difference in the quality of life, to the quality of life in that village. And that is really, in microcosm, the story of what's happened in the United States. 
the villagers said plainly that life in this model village got worse. Yep, they weren't as happy as they used to be. They weren't as united, they weren't, didn't function as a community, they didn't function as families as they had before. The book that made you famous and was a big bestseller came before these other books, Losing Ground, which meant what it says. People who were yeah. being helped by the government were losing ground. Explain. When I quit my job, I was not a right-wing ideologue. But at that time, I did not have a coherent political philosophy. I'd voted for Ronald Reagan. We're talking about 1981. And I had a sympathy for a lot of uh, libertarian ideas, but I didn't think of myself as a libertarian. I'd voted for Jimmy Carter in 1976, for heaven's sakes. That's, that's how incoherent my political views were. But there was only one thing I was convinced of after my years of evaluating social programs at this research company, and that was these programs didn't work and that they had made things worse. They had changed the lives of poor young people and especially black poor young people in ways that tempted them to do things in the short term that were disastrous in the long term. And so I wanted to write a book which talked about these perverse incentives and described them and used lots of data without any interpretation, just here's what things looked like from 1950 to 1980 and look at the way they've gotten worse. And then I came to the chapters where I had to say what I wanted to do about it. And it was in the course of writing those chapters that I kept finding myself saying, there are constraints on what outsiders can do that really make it difficult to get the incentives right. And I'd also read Robert Nozick by that time, uh, the brilliant uh, libertarian philosopher. And by the time I finished the last parts of Losing Ground, much to my surprise, I found I was a libertarian. Because government solutions rarely work. Yeah, I could think of thought experiments of policies that would work. For example, I had a thought experiment saying, well, suppose that we got rid of welfare altogether. Everything, lock, stock, and barrel. And I went through all of the changes and the calculations this would make of women in their expectations of men, the changes it would make in the behavior of men, the variety of other social feedback loops that would be triggered. But of course, we're never going to get rid of the system. And I could think of, guess what? Suppose we gave poor parents the money to send their children to schools of their choice. I went through in my mind, and on paper, all of the good things would happen. But of course, that at that time was impractical as well. In Losing Ground, you have this chart pointing out the sharply rising government expenditures addressing poverty. In that chart, you can see it had tilted upward the line in 1960 to 65, but then it starts to go steep. And guess when it gets even steeper, 1970 to 75, which is, are the years of Richard Nixon and uh, of Gerald Ford. What happened? Republicans increased spending on these oh, programs yeah. too. It's only in recent years that I have understood how that was able to happen and why it hadn't happened before. Why? Because in 1937, the Supreme Court said that we are going, we, the Supreme Court, consciously, explicitly, are going to say that we're siding with Alexander Hamilton in interpreting the phrase general welfare. It took the leash off. Until that decision, the government had stuck pretty close to the list of things in the Constitution that Congress was permitted to legislate on. And that one decision said, no, as long as it has some relationship to the general welfare, it's okay. It didn't make that much difference in the 40s and 50s. Because the power to do that stuff was that had been given to them by the court, but they hadn't acted on it much. Lyndon Johnson comes to office after the assassination. Lyndon Johnson, filled with ambition, not filled with scruples, with legislative majorities in both houses of Congress, and he takes that potential power to expand the rule of government that had been there for 20 years and acts on it. And young me said... Good. I have two parents. They're educated. They 
had me read. I have advantages. Other people don't have those advantages. It's time that government under wise planners step in and help the disadvantaged. That's the way I felt about it during the same period. It's hard to realize how naive we were about how public policy works at that time. We had very large job training programs, some of them multi-billion. People made a dollar and 12 cents more per week who had job training than people who didn't. You're talking about minuscule effects. The same disillusionment took a while to set in, but by the early 1970s, those who evaluated social programs on contract to the government, and that was my job during the 1970s, we knew there were no success stories. So all of these things that sounded so great on paper were not working, and guess what? That thing called labor force participation, which means that you are available to work, either you're working or else you're looking for work. For males, up until 1960, that had been close to 100%. It had been about 95% of males, and basically that means all males were able-bodied. That started to drop, and it started to drop not among affluent men. It started to drop among poor men. Which gets to the title of your book. It losing, wasn't just that the programs didn't work. Worse than that. People were losing ground. Losing ground. The same thing happened with crime. In the mid-1960s, all of the intellectual firepower was saying that punishment is a stupid way of dealing with crime, that putting people into prison only makes them into worse criminals, and, uh, and therefore we will reduce the use of prisons and we will increase the use of community solutions and probation and so forth. It all sounded very nice on paper and crime started to go through the roof. Now here's the graph yeah. from losing ground. Yep, uh, violent crime and property crime. That graph starts in 1950. Look at 1950 to 1963. It's virtually flat and low. So you had both low crime, but also among those people who did commit crimes, you had high rates in which they were caught. And of those who were caught, you had high rates of those who went to prison. Then you reduced the risk of going to prison. You reduced the risk of getting caught. In other words, you made it so that crime did pay. And look what happens. This is not rocket happened science. Mm -hmm. After your book yeah. was published. Yes, and so there, that peak of that one, that's again violent crime rate, is in the early 1990s, and look at what happened and the way that it went down. I would say that mass incarceration had a lot to do with it, because once you get arrested two or three or four times, the odds that you will continue to get arrested are high. There is a small part of the population, 5 to 7% of all those who are ever arrested, who commit an incredibly large proportion of all the crime. And in the mass incarceration, we took an awful lot of those, and I will say men, because they were overwhelmingly men. We took them off the streets. And forget about deterrence effect, forget about uh, any other things that prevented crime among people who were still not in jail. The people who were in jail were not committing crimes. They were incapacitated. You also started in the early 1990s what's called broken windows policing. And that means that if you jump the turnstiles in New York City subways, they start to arrest you. But let's explain it. It's the broken windows theory, which is that if you see a building with a broken window, you might break other windows. You think it's okay. This was a famous uh, political scientist named James Q. Wilson, and he observed that if one window is broken and it's not fixed, in a matter of weeks, all the windows will be broken because nobody cares. I understand the subways in New York City are not as pleasant to go on now as they were 15 years ago. You've probably seen people going in through the slam gates, hopping over the turnstiles. That uh, because you are not arresting the turnstile jumpers anymore, you aren't arresting people for lots of things anymore that you did during the 1990s and the first decade of the 2000s. And lo and behold, these are transmogrifying into more serious crimes, and they're also creating an atmosphere of 
danger, and just a sordid atmosphere in, in the places that are covered with graffiti and show other evidence of nobody caring. For more of my content, go to johnstossel.com. I post a new short video every Tuesday. That's at johnstossel.com. But America was cruel. America locks up a higher percentage of our people than almost any other country, mostly minorities. That's not right. If they are in jail for possession of a few too many ounces of marijuana and they've got a 20-year prison sentence, you can say, well, that's, that's stupid. But that's also not the way it usually works, so that you have a person who is putatively in prison for a drug offense. It turns out that he was actually arrested for uh, repeated robberies, but this got plea bargained down. So that instead of taking him to uh, court for the repeated robberies, they were going to sentence him on the drug charge. When you look at what these guys had done to get put in prison, there are very few minor offenders who end up in prison. Now, should we expect the racial composition of the prisoners to reflect the general population? No, we should expect it to reflect the population of people who are committing crimes. And because of that, yes, you have an awful lot of blacks in prison, you have a lot of Latinos in prison, you have almost no Asians in prison. They're a minority, right? But they just don't commit crimes, and so they very, very seldom go to prison. The composition of the prison population is not disproportionate to the crime rates of the different racial groups. So America just has more criminals? The same story is effectively true in Europe as well. The racial composition of the prison populations show the same profile they do in the United States. So back to losing ground. This happens because kids don't have two parents or a father in the home? That is a major factor. Clearly, the rise in crime that occurred in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, the cause was not genetic. Genes don't change in, in populations over a course of 15 or 20 years. It was a change in the environment. Let me turn to a kind of statement which is people will jump on you for making, which is kids need dads. And dads serve a couple of functions. One is that little boys latch on to role models. To some extent, little girls do too, but it's, it's a stronger trait in boys. Boys look up to who's, who's the male that I'm going to imitate. And I think those who are watching who are the parents of little boys and of little girls both have noticed the degree to which the little boy looks at the dad from a very young age, and he's obviously saying, okay, so this is how a guy is supposed to behave. Uh, if, if that male is not in the home, what's the role model that adolescent boys choose? The toughest, strongest adolescent boy in their group. A worse role model than which it is hard to imagine. Uh, so you have an interaction of social policy in the, that affects the formation of families that also has impacts down the road in the proportion of males growing up in single-parent families who end up in jail. So the welfare system, meant to help these families, said, we'll give you money if you're in need. But if you had a married man in the home who worked, you'd lose money. Yeah. Hence, again, losing ground. And let's look at the history. Your book was written a number of years ago. Since then, spending has only gone up. And it's interesting that Ronald Reagan supposedly slashed welfare in 81. And there was a little drop, briefly. And then but, slower growth, and then, but then it goes back, shooting back up again. And then there was welfare reform in 96, the end of welfare. Yep. And it flattens again for a year or two. It flattens a little bit. The demand constantly grows, and nobody has any incentives to say no. 
there's a program for uh, physical disability payments that technically ought to be a wonderful program to have because suppose a guy who's a manual worker is physically disabled, cannot work through an accident or something, this seems a reasonable thing to do as a government. And it is, if you administer it carefully. But in an era when medicine has been getting better and better, when uh, prostheses and other kinds of uh, things we didn't have available are improve, have been improving enormously, the proportion of males who are physically disabled and unable to work has risen dramatically. Now tell me how that is. And the answer, how it is, is the administration of the program, which is in effect saying to guys, if you can get the right doctor to write, to assign the right certificates, you can have an income stream for the rest of your life. And you're a sucker if you don't take this free stuff. And if you are insisting on, on hobbling to work, even though technically you perhaps are disabled, you're a chump. Do you see what you write in government policy? Reagan cited you and he talked about welfare reform. I raised some of the questions discussed by the scholarly work of Charles Murray. So he didn't really do much. Well, Bill Clinton on NBC News in the before the bell curve came out. And it, made you forbidden. Re, yes, referred to uh, my, my op-ed about the uh, coming white underclass and he said, Charles and I have disagreed about many things, as if we'd had these bull sessions at a college dorm. But uh, I th think he's done the country a service with this. Yeah, I read Charles Murray's latest article on this, and I think he did the country a great service. I mean, he and I often have disagreed, but I think his analysis is essentially right. So I saw that, and then I saw this Welfare Reform Act of 1996, which lots of people very generously said was a product of losing ground. But I looked at that Welfare Reform Act and said, is it better than nothing? Yeah. Is it going to make a big difference in the kinds of outcomes I, I'm most worried about? I don't see how it will. So the answer to your question is, I'll tell you cases where I've become really happy because I've seen that my writing has had effects. I was at Harvard some years ago and uh, with a student group there after uh, Coming Apart had been published. And I f found that the dinner we were having for the students was being attended by the couple that had financed my visit to Harvard. And so I went over uh, to thank them. And they said, yes, we're big fans. In fact, we read Coming Apart. And uh, so we moved from Greenwich, Connecticut, the famously wealthy upper class, to a little rural town in Connecticut because you said that uh, you, this is what you ought to do. And part of me at that point said, it's only a book, <laughs> you know. But then they said, and we love it. And it, they, it had changed their lives, and they had richer lives. I take a lot more satisfaction out of that than I do about getting credit for the 1996 welfare reform because it's more concrete. So on a retail level, has my writing, I think, done some good for some people? Yes, it has. On a national level, nah. Here's a graph we made up at Stossel TV, the poverty rate. And it shows that Americans were lifting themselves out of poverty before welfare began. Year after year, thousands and thousands of people then Checks started coming, and the poverty rate dropped even more for six or seven years. But since then, progress has stopped. It's gone up and down. Yeah. If, if you get, that starts in 1959, uh, we have now reconstructed poverty data going back to the end of World War II, when almost half of the population was below the poverty line. So we had an incredible success in the war on poverty from the end of World War II uh, to the late 1960s. By not having welfare programs. Yeah. So with this graph, uh, I have colleagues who will rightly point out that the poverty numbers don't include in-kind benefits, non-cash benefits. And if you add those in, there has been more progress. And I would say, yeah, but you know, suppose instead of using this measure of the poverty rate, what percentage of the population are making on their own? 
the income that keeps them above the poverty line. And then you would see not only that flat trend line that you just showed, you would see the proportion who are not making enough money to stay above poverty. Either. But why even ask that question? Why is it important that they make it on their own? And there's where we go back to self-respect again. Here's, here's where, where social class makes a difference. If you are in a family where you are a PhD uh, who only makes uh, a professor's salary and you have a wife who works as an executive at Google and your take-home pay is $95,000 a year and hers is $1.5 million, I think the professor friend actually know a couple that's pretty much in that situation. I don't think he has any problems with self-esteem. He's doing his job. He's uh, a fulfilling job and the rest of that. And and the fact that his wife is making a fortune is, is nice. It doesn't bother him. But if you talk are talking about lower income groups, it's really important that the guy have made the money uh, if he's to feel any self-respect. And he's not making that up. If you are a male who is able-bodied and you are not working, what's the point of your life? Go enjoy life. And that is why we are back at the nature of happiness and human flourishing. And happiness is not a good bowl of popcorn. Happiness is not good sex. Happiness is not any momentary pleasure. Happiness is a sense of getting to 70, a mere child by my standards at this point, but getting to 70 and saying to yourself, I, I can be satisfied with who I have been and what I have done. And if what you have done with your life is sort of wild away with amusements, I think you have a real hard time saying to yourself, I've spent a life well lived. And in your book, Coming Apart, you argue that America's dividing into those of us who went to college and got married and the divide and versus those who don't and the divide keeps getting bigger. The mistake I made in Coming Apart was I looked at the white working class. That book was exclusively about non-Latino whites. Again, to take the racial problems out of the equation. And I thought that the white working class was getting so demoralized that they would not be a political force. And what I missed was the degree to which they were getting angry. And uh, that surfaced uh, in 2016, big time. Why don't you turn your camera? Show them how many people come to these rallies. Turn them, go ahead, turn them. Go ahead. And it has proved ever since to be an extraordinarily powerful thing. There is a sense out there. 2016 meeting with the election. With the election Donald of Donald Trump. Trump, yeah. There is, I think, an enormous sense. The demoralization is part of it, but also a real sense that we're no longer living in a country that gives me the respect I deserve, that gives me the chances I deserve. And that explains a lot of the energy behind the election of Donald Trump then. And it has been fueled by the increasingly obvious, open, unapologetic disdain of the people who live in flyover country, of the rednecks. Rednecks is the only ethnic slur you can use these days and get away with, you know? This really is the only one. And this is not lost on ordinary Americans, and it's not just the white working class, it's increasingly the black working class, it's not just the working class, it's also increasingly the middle class who look at the people who are running the country and say, we don't know these people, we don't recognize them as having the same values, the same patriotism, the same devotion to the country that we do. You criticize the upper class for supporting welfare, help the poor, but culturally abandoning people. They've abdicated their role as stewards of the culture, celebrating marriage, community, productive work, the fulfillment that people of faith derive. Um, celebrating doesn't mean passing laws. It means no, talking, it, about uh, it. talking about it. And they don't have to go out and stand in the soapbox. 
But if you are in a happy marriage with children and it has been a source of great satisfaction, don't go out there and say, oh, but all families are equal in terms of their functioning and so forth. You don't have to demonize single mothers. You can acknowledge there are lots of single mothers doing a heroic job, but they are doing it under very difficult circumstances. There's nothing wrong with saying, you know what, it's really good for the kids if they're born into a married family, and the married family really is the way to go. They don't say that. They, they go out of their way to say, no, no, no. It's almost as if the elite wants to keep the good stuff for itself. And we, at more affluent people who go to college, are behaving in the ways you advocate. We do tend to get married. We yeah. do tend to work. Yes, and, and that's been true since the 1980s. And there that's was, the coming apart that yeah, you're talking uh, about. And we marry somebody else who does. In 1993, I wrote an op-ed titled The Coming White Underclass. And at that time, the out-of-wedlock birth ratio for whites was about uh, 22 23%. And I said, guess what? Uh, whites are now approaching the same level that blacks were back in the early 1960s when Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote about the breakdown of the black family. And I said, what we have coming down the road is a white underclass. And then and it became obvious that these births were concentrated among low-income whites. And in a way, what I talked about in Coming Apart was the realization of that prediction. It wasn't that we had a coming white underclass. We had a white underclass. But it would be arrogant for affluent white people to preach to poorer people. The sign of a vibrant, growing civilization, according to many historians, is a confident upper class, confident in its own values, and one that, that openly says, okay, this is the way people ought to live in this society. The Victorian British, classic example. The Victorians uh, basically socialized the entire English population into Victorian middle-class values. And as a result, when London was urbanizing at an unprecedented rate, the crime rate did not go up. Unheard of to have that kind of level of, of urbanization and no increase in crime but it was the Victorians who had successfully passed on their values. In the, in the United States, the upper class feels guilty. They feel arrogant and look down on those who aren't part of the upper class, but they also have a sense of guilt about, uh, about their being there and other people not being there. It's very dysfunctional. While you've called yourself a libertarian today and you wrote a book, What It Means to Be a Libertarian, on Twitter recently you wrote, you're no longer a libertarian. I call myself what? a Madisonian now. Nobody knows what that means. I know. I'm not in the business of mass marketing anything. <laughs> and, and Madisonian now captures my evolved attitude. I think libertarian solutions are entirely compatible with uh, vibrant families and communities. In fact, I think they are the way to achieve vibrant families and community. But I'm also... Um, much more attuned to the importance of virtue in the people than I used to be. By virtue in the people, I'm borrowing the language of the founders, who said this constitution will not work except for moral and religious people. And my earlier libertarianism said that if you had a libertarian society, that in a way that would take care of itself because behaving in virtuous ways would be rewarded. Well, I think it's also important to have a culture that openly values the traditional virtues. And I think also a religious culture gives you a huge leg up in that. And by the way, in that regard, the founders were not doctrinaire Christians. Uh, Jefferson was a deist. Some of the other founders were, we don't know how orthodox they were in their Christianity, but they were unanimous in saying that the role of religion in enabling a free society was huge. We libertarians tend not to say that. No, and, and uh, the founders did. Madison did very emphatically. I'm increasingly impressed as I've gotten older how brilliant the Constitution was 
Yeah, they should have gotten rid of slavery. That was the tragic flaw that was bound to come back and, and pull us down. But the Constitution otherwise really worked for a century and a half in ways that were wonderful to behold. So, Madisonian, that's what I am. And part of that is the forbidden words today, Western culture? Yeah. And what does Western culture mean? And why is it forbidden to say that today? That that's what you need to make a society work well for its people? The world has had three or four great civilizations, but the two that stand out are the, and apologies to my South Asian friends, but I would say China uh, and the West. And in these two cases, you had civilizations that developed fully realized cultures and ethics and economies and they had different strengths, but they both had magnificent strengths. We are inheritors of the West. We in the United States, it was founded by Brits, basically, British, the British peoples, and then it's expanded into Europe, and we've more recently had immigrants from other parts of the world. But the culture here is grounded in Western culture. And why people don't recognize now the great achievements of that culture mystifies me. Did Western countries do bad things ever? Yes. Did they have wars? Yes, they did that. Did they colonize country? Yeah, they did all those things. Uh, and those have to be considered. But art, literature, science, health, towering achievements. We should be proud of them. It seems like a lot of what you write about, human achievement, you've just lost now amidst the trend toward equity. Aren't you upset? I'm deeply depressed. No, it's worse than that. I don't see a way back out. We are looking not just now at a failure to elect a person on the right, we now have do not have a right <clears throat> that I can recognize at all. I, I got along fine with uh, traditional conservatives, with Bill Buckley and, and with the neocons, uh, Irving Crystal and so forth. I had disagreements, but you had common ground as well with me as a libertarian. And also for a long time, it seemed to me that libertarian views were, were gaining ground. You and I, if I may speak for you, we are alone in the world now. What is the organized group that wants to have limited government return? It's certainly not the Trump people, not the MAGA people. They are talking about big government being just fine as long as the kind of big government that works for us. Who these days is talking about we really ought to do something about the deficit that... <laughs> You have a few lone voices. You, you don't have any. The things we believe in, because we, we have extremely similar beliefs, John. We have watched on our own lifetime our hopes and dreams turn to smoldering ruins. Uh, and so why are you smiling? <laughs> because what else am I going to do? It's, it's uh, depressing doesn't begin to capture it. And, and in a way, talk about feeling that maybe you ha your life hasn't been lived as fruitfully as you would like. It's so bad in terms of my hopes for this country. I don't see how you energize a new generation to recover that. The good news is that old people are habitually too pessimistic. And, and so let's say that I cannot foresee how you turn this around, but here I will hearken back to the religious great awakenings that the United States has had three of, four depending on which historian you read, but that, that came out of nowhere. And in the early 19th century, it resulted in a reduction of alcohol consumption, which had been incredible 
to, to very low levels in a matter of a couple of years. And in other ways, you've had enormous impacts of great awakenings. It's not impossible that there will be a civic great awakening, reawakening of some sort. By reduction in alcohol consumption, you're not talking prohibition. No, I'm talking in the early 19th century, uh, Americans drank enormous amounts of whiskey. And the, as part of the religious great awakening, you had the temperance movement and the empirical record about the per capita consumption of alcohol in the early 19th century was that uh, it dropped like a rock. This country has proved itself in the past to be able to, to spin on a dime. I simply don't see how that happens this time, and I do see lots of signs of a civilization in decay. But you're an old man. As I'm you old said, man. old people are pessimistic. Yep, yep, and uh, I'm perfectly willing for other people to say that to me and to say, you're right, go out there and fight the good fight. Thank you, Charles Murray. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop the first and third Mondays of every month. You can subscribe everywhere you get podcasts.